to Philippians chapter 4. Before we do that, before we do that, I just want to ask if there is any, it's been too long since I've given out a few books, and I have, I have one that, if you're not, if you're not a member and you're just like saying, hey, I want to know more about it, or why do you guys talk about membership? Why membership? It's a little book called, Why Should I Join a Church? Is there someone here that would like this? I'd love to give this to you. All right, Richie, I have one. Yeah, that's right. I have one more. Anybody other? Anyone else? Why I should join a church? Anyone? If not, that's okay. Here's, here's one. How should I serve my church? How should I serve my church? Ever find, like, where's my place? I'm not sure if I'm finding the right place. This is a nice little book on, well, how should I serve my church? Anyone? I know that doesn't mean. And then here's one more. What if I don't feel like going to church? What if I don't? You, you see a bunch of people raise their hand. So we're going to give this to Jeanette right now. Go anyway. Yeah, the answer is uh, go anyway. <laughs> okay, I still have. Why should I join the church? Okay, let's look at Philippians chapter 4. As you notice, we're getting close to the end. Um, not going to make any promises, but... I'm, we're going to choose another New Testament letter. New Testament letters are more prone to being able to go verse by verse. You don't want to go verse. It'd probably be hard to go through verse by verse through Genesis. That's just not the way Genesis even works. Um, but I, I am praying about a few books of the Bible. So if you want to give me any suggestions, Hebrews. let me know. Hebrews? Hebrews? I got I to gotta vote for Hebrews. So. I thought it was and what, Ben? Habakkuk. Habakkuk. No, I said New Testament letter. Oh. Yeah, Habakkuk is a prophetic book. I, pre I preached on Habakkuk two Thanksgiving months ago. So in 19, it would have been 20, in 2019, I did, I think, three sermons on it. But the ladies did Habakkuk. And the ladies did, yeah. So pro I think it's a... It's absolutely important, good book to study. I don't know if we'll do it on a Wednesday night. We got one vote for Habakkuk. I mean Hebrews. We got H's. Okay, Colossians. What do you, he, he, we got two for Hebrews. You got three for Hebrews, okay? Two for we got two for Colossians. Okay. Third John. Huh. What's that? Galatians. You know, what they're. Are gonna do for the other 60 minutes? Yeah. So, they're, those, those are all really good books. So, let, let, me, let me set us up for tonight's passage here. Um, you remember last week, we were, we were, Paul is finishing this letter, and he is, he's getting as close as he gets to saying thank you with saying, yet it was kind of you to share with my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you'd sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek a gift, but I seek fruit that increases to your credit. Now let's look at let's look at this passage up on the whiteboard here. It's in your do you have it on your sheets tonight? Yeah. Okay, it is on your sheets. Okay, flip. we're going to look at 18 through 20. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay. So let's make, let's take a few minutes and make some observations about the six. What, what is Paul doing, first of all, in this, in this paragraph? What is Paul doing in this paragraph? And where do you see it? Okay. Is he thanking? In some ways he is. Where do you see that? Well, if you read the whole thing, he's kind of like thanking people for supplying his needs. 
Okay. In verse 8, 18, he's definitely, we're seeing him, he's saying, I've received full payment and more. He is, I am well supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, sacrifice acceptable unto God. There is gratitude in his heart. What else is he doing here, Dave? I think it's a double confirmation of what he was saying beforehand. Yeah. Yeah, this idea here, this full payment, is that I all my needs have been met. All my ne- I've been supplied fully, and there's this. He's just encouraging them, and there's a gratitude. Yes, Ryan. I think he's reinforcing that uh, you give, and you're hoping that God will give back. Yeah. So, so what by doing that? What is he trying to do for the Philippians? So he's encouraging them, showing them the fruit of their work. And in in so doing, he's seeking to encourage them. And so he encourages them. Okay, Brian brought out, he encourages them by saying, you know, these gifts that you've sent, he call, he says they're a fragrant offering. What kind of, what's, what's that, what does that mean? A fragrant offering. Look, he's saying, he's saying with all the Yeah. When he, it was like there was a pleasing aroma. Um, would someone real quickly read Ephesians 5, 1 and 2? Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. When someone has it, kind of lift your head up and you got it, Dan? Go ahead, read it. No, Ephesians 5. <laughs> oh, I, I promise you, actually, this is a real good book, though. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 1, especially 1 into 2. Mm-hmm. A su- as, and so there's a sweet su- smelling aroma. Same idea right here is the fragrant offering. And who is this, and what does he describe as the fragrant offering in that passage? Christ dying, Christ dying love for us is a fragrant offering. Here, what a, what a high compliment as he says, it is a fragrant offering. Just like we see in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. And then, but he goes, he says, it's a, it's a sacrifice. There's again, the Old Testament imagery of offering up our sacrifices unto God. And it was acceptable. It, it's, it's a sacrifice that's acceptable. And, and as Ryan, you brought up, it's pleasing to God. You, what you did is pleasing to God as you gave. Okay, what, what else do you say? Yeah. And I think just to continue that a bit, is he's referencing that fragrant offering in, in Christ's sacrifice, right? Mm-hmm. And just a few verses before this, right? You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Yeah. So they're actually giving, but getting sacrificial. Gifts. Yeah. I think there's even more of it. Yeah. There, right? Yeah. And there was a, a deep sacrifice. Even, even as you bring this up, I mean, as, as he's they're finishing this letter, he wants... Epaphroditus was a big deal. If you remember Epaphroditus, look at chapter 2. Turn your Bibles to Philippians 2. At the very end of Philippians 2. Remember, he, he speaks high praise of this man when he says... He said, I thought to send you Epaphroditus, my fellow... My brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. So they had sent Epaphroditus to, to Paul. Paul had been being ministered to through the, to the Philippians by means of this man. And he says he was long for he was sick. 
He was ill and he was distressed because they heard this. Indeed, he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him to you, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for they nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete that which was lacking in your service to me. And I think what was lacking is they couldn't come and do it themselves. They sent him, and he was, sac he was a sacrificial gift to them. And now he is now ending this letter and rejoicing in their ministry to him. Yeah, Ben. Uh, so I would normally put this under the what stands out to you. Yeah, but that fits. This, this seems like an odd way to speak uh, in that he's basically saying what he did is pleasing and acceptable to God. Uh, and my God will supply every need of yours. It, it almost seems like something a priest would say when somebody brings a sacrifice. Like, yes, God accepted it, and here's what you get. Yeah, in, and in some ways he is like a priest. He's, he is... He's a pastor, he is a, an apostle, and he is speaking and teaching them. And he, I mean, just in so far as as a minister, I want to remind you of the truth. God has forgiven your sins in Christ. Remember this. But you're good, at, you, you bring up, Ben, this observation. I mean, he is speaking, he is saying, your gifts have been, and he says, they have been this acceptable and pleasing to God. And then, he then brings us right into this, and he says, my God will supply. He's reminding of them of promises, probably because they're going to struggle with anxiety. Maybe they're going to have face great needs. Okay. Yeah. Why do you? Yeah. Why do you think he's doing this? Why would he? Because not everybody's going to be a believer. What's that? Because not everybody is going to be a believer. Well, I think he's assuming that this church is a church full of believers, but they don't have a lot of Bible knowledge like we do. They don't own Bibles. Some of them are Jews, but some of them are Gentiles. They're new Christians. They're needing me to taught. Yes. I mean, it, I mean, it's... I mean, by saying my God, is he saying, look, everything that God's done for me, he'll do for you as well? Yeah, I think that you have that experience. I think he's saying, my God, my God, the very God that I, I'm... You recognize me as an apostle. And my God will supply all of every need of yours. And of course, what is he doing in this last sentence? Yes, Dan. I don't have an answer to your question. Oh. Okay, so is it you want to face? Let's let's come back. What well, can we? Was it about what Ben was just saying or what? Okay. So what it, what is the purpose of the, what? So he adjusts. He says here at this beginning, and he's continuing on this end thing. I am excited. I'm thankful that you have given full payment and more. I'm supplied by the gifts that Epaphroditus brought. Epaphroditus had brought. It's a fragrant offering. God is pleased by this. And then what is he doing here? What is the purpose of this last verse? Assurance. Okay, he's giving assurance of what? That God will supply every yeah. need. Okay, and he, wa he, wants to he wants to strengthen, in a, giving them assurance, strengthen their faith in the God that they sacrificially are, they're trusting in him in their sacrificial giving as they've given. Yes, hands all over. Um, so Dan, I saw first. Yeah. This is what I was going to say. I think it does answer that question. Okay, good. Yeah. And so that they, he gets the credit, he gets the glory, and provides for us. So that's, that's a great passage that I think in many ways 
can can come to here. I'm, we're actually going to go to that in a little bit. I actually have it on the PowerPoint that has the extended um, paragraph and from from him and through him and to him. And we actually get this right here, right here to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. I saw Dave and then Mike. New Living Translation yeah. puts it this way. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your mm. needs from his. Right? Yeah. The sa- that, that, that's a helpful way of bringing out the same God that takes care of me will supply all your needs. He is, he is a pastor shepherd that is, you know, it'd be like a pastor saying, the God that has helped me, he's going to help you. The God, the God that, and remember, we've been just hearing him say, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I've had money, and then I've had no money. I've de- dealt with abundance, and I've dealt with need. But I've realized that I can be content in anything, for I, have, I, have all, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I've, been, I've learned that contentment. Now he comes and he says, and the God that did that for me will supply. Now he says, every need of yours. So that's the end result of that. What? That is the end result of that. Well, I think. If you have all that, that will be your end result. This is the end result of this God, right? This God. This, he, he wants such a faith in this God. The people, this, this is happening because they put their faith and trust in Christ and not in their money. And they were generous and they gave. Ginger? Well, at that time, there were so many little gods that people were worshiping. Oh. Yeah. And, and he's saying, my God. Yeah. And, and I think, I don't think he is, it, when he's saying my God, I don't think he is like saying, and it's not yours either. Yeah. Just like if I said to you in a sermon, my God met me this week. And none of you are sitting there going, well, who do you think our God is? You know, you're not like, you're not thinking that in any type of contrast. You're just, I'm, I'm emphasizing. Mike, you wanted to add something? So, according to his riches and glory in Jesus Christ, so hmm. their assurance is for the future. And I think you point out every need of yours is not material yeah. of that. Right. For what exactly they gave, so it could be like the first debunking of prosperity gospel or something. Yeah. Um, you know, it's according to God's riches and glory. Yeah. And that's what, they should, that's, that's what they will receive their every need. So, it, yeah, it's according to his, his riches in glory. He, he gives three phrases in Christ Jesus. I mean, there could be a sermon right there about what kind, and then you have number one and then number two, and each one of these phrases come to the, have to do with, you know, you know, where it comes from. His it comes from his supply in glory, his riches, and I guess these in glory in Christ Jesus. Um, and we would want to understand, okay, what does he mean? What why is he doing this? What is he saying? And what is but what I'm hearing you also say. So he says you. I'm thankful for your generosity. It is pleasing to God. And let that fuel your faith as you remember the all-sufficient one who does meet every one of our needs. And, and that, as Mike kind of brings this up, does that mean that he's saying, you'll, does that mean that you'll never, ever go without? What do you think? Do you think that's what Paul was promising? Grandma. Well, um, the need. One of my commentaries just that just skipped me. And yeah. It was so, so true. Said God will provide everything needed. Anything he withholds is not needed. Exactly. And these people were in need. So he was just reassuring them that what you really need. Yeah. What what we he will hear that everything that we truly need he will supply. There are many times when we don't 
we think we need something and God withholds it and we say, it could be, I need love from my spouse. God might not supply love from your spouse. But he will give you every need. He will meet, supply every need. I guess you could say, to be content in Christ and to glorify him. Can we say that? God, Paul would say, he will supply every need so that you will be satisfied in God, truly contented in God, to meet your needs and glorify him, which is what you were meant to do. I mean, there are, there are some... And, and the question would be is, did Paul really mean, though, that you'd never go without food? No, I mean, listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. He says, this passage says some beautiful things. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So this every need of yours is supplied through Jesus. He gave his son, he's going to give us all things. Well, the question would be, what all things? Is it the prosperity gospel, Joel Olstein? You can have all things you want if you just promise, you know, you claim these promises of God. No. Who it, he says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or sword. Did famine and nakedness plague the church? Yes. And he's actually saying it's going to. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are being regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things, nakedness and distress and famine and persecution, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us because... He didn't spare his own son, but he'll graciously give us all things. And we could add to be content in Christ alone to, glo to the glory of the Father. Which is a miracle done in the heart when that happens. It is not the natural. Paul just had enough willpower and he was a, he, to be able to be content in all circumstances. He had come to know Jesus Christ truly in a way that satisfied him and he wants these Philippians to know this he this gift is well pleasing to God and he wants them to know that this God will supply every need of theirs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus and it is a glorious glorious call, promise isn't it it I mean I love what what Dorothy just mentioned Reminds her his quote anything that God withholds. What? How did you say that? God will provide everything needed. Anything He withholds yeah. is not needed. Everything, anything He withholds, He is not needed. I, I like what J. I. Packer says similarly. He says one day we shall see that nothing, literally nothing, which could have increased our eternal happiness has been denied us. And that nothing, literally nothing, that could have reduced that happiness has been left with us. No, because he is working all things for our great and eternal joy. And he is going to supply everything. And this, it is a walk of faith in Christ. Or as John Newton wrote in a letter very similarly, he says, All shall work together for good. Everything is needful that God sends. And nothing can be needful that he withholds from us. Everything is needful that God sends. He sends a tribulation in your life. It's needful. And if he withholds something that you want so badly, it's what he intended. But for what purpose? To grow our faith. Okay. To grow our faith. Sanctification. I guess we could put all. What else? What, what, why else? What does it mean to be sanctified? Be made like 
to be made holy and to be made like Christ, to be pure and blameless before the day of Christ, to be conformed into his image. He says he works all things together for good. And then he, he says, to, in order that we may be conformed into the image of his dear son. God is working these things, and this is what he has called us to. Okay, what, what other things stand out to you in the, these cl almost closing verses? There's one more paragraph at the end. Isn't there a place in the Bible where it says that God takes care of the birds, so why wouldn't he take care of us? It is. Does anybody know where that is? God takes care of the birds. Why? Of course he'll take care of us. Where is that? It's where? Yeah, it's Matthew somewhere. Good. Get, that, you nailed it. <laughs> it's in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's on Matthew chapter 6. Oh, it's, a, it's at the end. It's the last section. In fact, let's look there. In fact, I think I, I'm, I have some of that up on the PowerPoint here. Even though I don't have those exact verses. It's worth reading. Someone read that. So these aren't the verses. These are the. This is at right after that, Matthew six. He says, "Do not be anxious. But what you eat or drink or what you shall put on, it's not your body more than clothing." And your... so don't don't look at the verses up on the screen. Those are at the end of it. Go before that. Go ahead and read that. Keep going. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the hill, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Thank you. And, and just, he, he says both, consider the lilies of the field and consider the birds of the air. God cares for them. How much more of worth are you? You are much more worth. And then he says this at the end of this paragraph. Therefore, do not be anxious of what you eat or drink or what you shall wear. For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I will take care of you. I will meet your truest needs. Trust me. For the Christian, where does God's promises and supply come to us from? Like on by by what by what merit or by what resource does it come? Yeah. God's mercy. Okay, it surely comes by God's mercy. It's it is abs that's absolutely true. From this passage, where does he say it comes from specifically? It says his riches. That's a big deal. He's really rich. He has, and we would want to study and say, what does that mean in glory? His riches in glory. I think his riches that are glorious, they come from this glorious God who is in heaven. And yet they're rooted in because of Jesus Christ. When it says in Christ Jesus, what does that mean in Christ Jesus? What? Okay. Sacri sacrifice, God but sacrifice his son mm -hmm. so that we can be with him and be free. God sacrificed his son so that we can be with him and be free. Yes. In Christ Jesus means that you're part of a body, you're a saint. Okay. You you have you have entered into this union with Christ? Yeah, you're into that, and you are 
receive all the benefits because you are, it's based on his name. And it, it is what Kathy said, based on his sacrifice. We are now, because of his name, he accepts us and he supplies all that he would give on the Son of Man to the Son, I mean, the Son of God goes to us. And this is based on what Jesus has done for us. And, and I want you to ponder the riches, of, the riches of this when you look at Romans. This is a passage that Dan pointed us to. Um, Romans 11. He says, no, that's Romans 8. Okay, where is that? I know it's in the notes here. I think it's the last passage. You nervous, Julie? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's find it. There it is. <laughs> Julie put the PowerPoint together. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid. What's the answer to that question? Who has given a gift to God that he might be repaid? No one. Because he doesn't need anything. He has everything. Oh, the riches of him. For from him and through him and to him are all things. Paul says it here. He knows it here. As he wraps up this letter, he's going to say all of this. Remember, remember right before this in verse 17, he's going to say, what I care more than anything is that fruit would abound to you, my ch spiritual children. That's what I truly want. And now he says, I, he's wrapping up. And again, he says, I am so thankful. I have received all these things, these gifts, and it is pleasing to you. Pleasing to God, I should say. And he's going to meet your needs because of his great riches in Christ Jesus. Never forget that young, he's saying, to the church. And then he would say, to God be the glory. Oh, that's good. Um, to God be the glory forever and ever. And he, amen. And he gives, and what, what would you call this last verse? Verse 20. There'd be a term for that kind of last verse. What's he, what's he doing in that last verse? Doxology. It is a doxology. And, he's, and this is something that Paul brings out many times. He brings it out at the end of chapter 11. He brings it up in chapter 1 um, at verse 11. He, he talks about to the glory of God in all things. And... The, the one thing, and maybe we'll talk about this next week as we finish up in that last paragraph, is Paul says, your, your offering was pleasing to God. There is a way in which we should live to please God, and there is a way in which we wrongfully seek to please God. There is a way in which we are running around Wanting, oh, if only God will accept me. I need to earn God's favor. That's not good, is it? I just need to earn God's favor. I just need him to accept me. If only he would accept me. I'm going to do these things for God to accept me. There's another attitude that says, it's amazing. God accepts me in Christ Jesus. He has cast his love upon me. He's never going to stop doing good for me. I want to please him. I want to please my Father in heaven. There's a, there's a difference between those two things, isn't there? There's a big difference. There's a difference between heaven and hell there. You are not going to heaven if your trajectory is only, I have to work so that God will be pleased and accept me in the end. 
Because you are putting your faith and your trust in your ability to be acceptable to God. But that is not what Paul is saying here. And there are many times in which he speaks this way. That the heart of a true believer is, he has accepted me. And because of that, I want to please him. It's like a father. It's like a child who is absolutely, completely secure that his dad loves him. And he just loves to please his dad. And there's no way he's trying to earn his sonship. It's just, a, and, and that is where God is bringing us and wants us to be. Because a mark of a child of God is him or her that pleases God. And there are many passages that speak to this. We're not going to go into them tonight because I want to get into prayer. Is there any other questions or comments about this passage before we, yeah, Ginger? <laughs> Yeah, he's in jail. He's in prison for, for the sake of the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. He, his satisfaction wasn't in comfort or his freedom. Where was his satisfaction in? It was in, in God in Christ Jesus. This is for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. I consider all things as lost. Chapter 3, verse 8. Yes. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing as what Ginger just mentioned. Even... Beyond that, he not only wasn't focused on himself at all, he was completely focused on Christ and, and his purpose, but he even went another step to in, focus on encouraging others. Yeah. Um, yes. Know, which is just well, so yeah, what, what, you're right, Tracy. What, what's so amazing about this whole letter, and this has been a great book to... So f one of the things that you helped me over the last year, we studied this. We really studied it. It started in July of last year. And we've been studying it throughout the year. We take breaks here and there. And when I was in Africa, I spoke for long teaching times where we, I interacted with pastors over an overview of Philippians. And we looked at four important themes in Philippians. And one of the great themes was his ministry to the others in the midst of... In con you know, contrasting by his circumstances, which really highlight the type of servant, Jesus servant like heart that he is modeling and calling us to. And, and so my four sermons on that were my four sermons were one was we need to see, if we're going to be Christians or if we're going to just be leaders, because I was talking to pastors, we need to see certain things with spiritual eyes. And in Paul, I pointed out all these things that Paul saw things differently. He saw Jesus differently. He saw ministry differently. He saw all these, he saw prayer differently. He saw service differently. He saw giving differently. He saw them with spiritual eyes. And then he served in a different way. He served and he sacrificed in a different way. And he rejoiced in a different way. And we see that kind of theme coming through in this letter. It's an awesome letter. We're going to pray now, and if you take your sheets and turn it to the other side, and I want to, in setting our tone towards prayer, we got a lot of prayer requests, and we're going to do it similar to last week, and we're just going to, I'm just going to ask you and urge you that a lot of you will just pray and volunteer. Just When we pray, it could be a 30-second prayer, short prayer, 10-second prayer. Dear God, please be with so-and-so, and that's all. You do not have to pray long. I want to, I want to, I want to kind of set the tone here by reading something from this book called Only a Prayer Meeting by Spurgeon. Think 150 years ago, Charles Spurgeon said this in a meeting on, a, on probably a Wednesday night. What a company we have here tonight. It fills my heart with gladness and my eyes with tears of joy to see so many hundreds of persons gathered together. Wouldn't that be awesome? Hundreds of persons gathered together at what is sometimes wickedly described as only a prayer meeting, which is the title of the book. It is good for us to draw nigh unto God in prayer and especially good to make up a great congregation for such a purpose. We have attended little prayer meetings of four or five and we have been glad to be there for we have the promise of our Lord's presence. But our minds are grieved to see so little attention given to united prayer by many of our churches. We have longed to see great numbers of God's people coming up to pray. 
pray, and we now enjoy this sight. Let us praise God that it is so. We could, how could we expect a blessing if we were too idle to ask for it? How could we look for Pentecost, meaning what happened in the book of Acts, if we never met with one accord in one place to wait upon the Lord? Brethren, we shall never see such change for the better in our churches in general till the prayer meeting occupies a higher place in the esteem of Christians. To mix it up with the weekend lecture and really make an end of it is a sad sign of declension. I wonder some two or three earnest souls in such churches do not band themselves together to restore the prayer meeting and bind themselves with a pledge to keep it up whether the minister will come to it or not. Um, I just want to remember that we are coming to our great God and let us bring big petitions, specific petitions, um, our requests, to God. And so tonight, um, I'm going to start by sharing.